Hey there class, Professor Steve here. Um, welcome back to our second uh, edition of the phytoplankton lectures um, where we'll be covering this time the eukaryotic phytoplankton. And um, there's no real reason for me to have separated these two lectures except for the fact that um, I do want you to know that they exist in both classes and that uh, and 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 where each group sort of falls under under which category in this this in the in the domains of life um, each group falls and it's relatively easy there's only the one group that falls underneath the prokaryotic or the bacteria and that's the cyanobacteria we covered those last lecture and the remainder that we're going to cover today um, the haptophytes dinoflagellates and diatoms fall under the eukaryotes making them much more related to us than they are to, to this group of phytoplankton over here, but functionally they're all doing the same thing, right? Primary production. They're all autotrophs. And so today we'll be covering the eukaryotes. So uh, in the grand scheme of all of them, the first group was, was the cyanobacteria, and the second group are the haptophytes. Um, so the the prime example, the most studied, most well known, and the and the main example of, of a haptophyte is is what we call the coccolithophores. Um, so these guys are are unicellular. Uh, they're about three to ten microns. Um, this word's kind of a, a mouthful, but it's but it's it's also fairly um, fairly recognizable word. Um, so these guys are pretty small. They can get up to be about 20 microns, um, but they range about 10. So they range about 10 to 20 times the size of a cyanobacterium. Um, they're ubiquitous, which means they're everywhere, and they just kind of hang out and wait for environmental conditions to be right for them to to bloom and start to grow. The thing that really makes them stand out is they make these plates of armor, and these plates are called coccoliths, right? So it's it's a it's a ex it's basically an exoskeleton and this is a electron micrograph of a dead one and when they're alive this is kind of these are kind of covered with tissue but um, these plates that they make give them protection and structure um, and it's made out of calcium carbonate. Um, and this is pretty significant because there's a lot of calcium in the ocean, there's a lot of carbonate in the ocean, the CO2 kind of equilibrates with with carbonate in the ocean. Um, and so in their growth and death and life cycle, they affect quite strongly both the calcium cycle and the carbon cycle. This, this carbon in, in the carbonate ion makes, means they affect the, the, the carbon cycle in a way um, above and beyond just that of, 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 uh, of carbon fixation, right? Because they're primary producers, so they're fixing carbon, but they're also consuming and moving carbon around in their shell, in the making of their shells. The other significance of their of their armor of making this kind of skeleton is it makes them heavier, um, and when they become heavier, when they have a higher mass, uh, they, they they begin to be able to to sink. Okay, so tiny cells, one to ten microns, very tiny. They don't have a mass. If we, if we think back to our sediment uh, lecture, the if it, um, and grains of different kinds of sediment, um, as the particle gets smaller and smaller, it's less and less likely, or it's a very, very long time at least, that, that something would, would be able to sink through the, through the entire length, depth of the ocean. But if you make something like a heavy armor out of calcium carbonate, then you become heavier um, and, you can, and you can settle. And there's some very high significance associated with organisms, um, especially the phytoplankton, that can sink. Um, to the sea floor, and uh, so we'll mention this more and more, but we won't get to the significance of it um, until another unit. Uh, but for right now, the big significance of that is sedimentation. So these guys form and they grow uh, in such high amounts, and you can see blooms of coccolis here. You get that carb calcium carbonate shell reflects white, um, and and this is this shows you how large their blooms can be that they can be seen from outer space from a satellite image. Um, so they grow to such high amounts that when they begin to die, or if, if conditions are right and they start to sink out, they form large, large sediment deposits. And there are entire stretches of sediment, if we remember from the sediment lecture, that's biogenous, biogenous sediments, right? So it's sediments coming from uh, organic life or uh, living sources. Um, and prehistorically, um, these, these guys used to grow to such great extents that they laid down multiple layers over long periods of time um, and gigantic sediment layers made in, entirely from their their skeletons um, and then um, 
as time goes on, geological time goes on, these things become uh, uplifted and exposed and we get get large um, topographic features like the White Cliffs of Dover made entirely from calcium carbonate shells from phytoplankton. So the third group uh, are dinoflagellates. The dinoflagellates, there's many species associated with this, a few are, are sort of determined to be the major ones, um, but I won't have you know any specific examples of dinoflagellates, just um, what makes them stand out. So we're starting to get a little bit bigger of an organism now, 80 to 100 microns, so that's a tenth of a millimeter. Um, and they're named be uh, so because dino meaning two means two, flagellates meaning flag flagellum or the whip-like tails or structures, and you can just barely see one like right here. But they usually have one sort of sticking straight out like this, and then one that kind of goes around the center of this, and, and so they're named dinoflagellates because they have two flagella, and this helps them for in locomotion or moving around. And these guys are sort of, uh, um, they're, they're, they're highly abundant, they're very productive, um, they sort of come in succession after the most uh, dominant phytoplankton. Uh, which is the diatoms, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but again, we have another organism that creates a type of armor, a cellular uh, exoskeleton, if you will. Uh, but these guys make it out of cellulose. Um, we call that armor a theca. If it's a cellulosic armor, we call it theca. Um, but again, er anything that makes a, a, a skeleton or armor plating kind of thing makes it heavier and gives it the ability to sink to the sea floor. So the significance of certain diatom species, I'm sorry, not diatom, dinoflagellate species, is um, there are a few of them that um, when the environmental conditions are right, they bloom to very high degrees, and you can see how many of them there are here. Um, and when they bloom to these very high degrees and the environmental conditions are right, they produce neurotoxins, so toxic chemicals. Um, and this is how we get what we call a red tide. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's actually... They, this, these neurotoxins can actually be quite dangerous to humans and, and of course are a health and, and safety risk, especially when you're eating the organisms that eat them, like shellfish. Usually if you have an area uh, where shellfish are, are fished for and, um, and you have a red tide, usually that industry is shut down for, for quite a bit of time until you know the waters are safe and the organisms are, that, are, that are eating diatoms, such as clams and <clears throat> such as clams and mussels and other filter feeding organisms um, to make sure they're safe. Another species of diet, uh, dinoflagellate, sorry, uh, or many species of dinoflagellates are also bioluminescent, so they, they, they have a, a mechanism of proteins that makes them glow, and, and uh, whenever the water is disturbed around them, they light up like this. As you see the waves crashing on a beach here, can light up an entire coastline. The specific guy here has a, has a, has a Latin name, but um, the name that most people give him is just a sea sparkle. So the fourth and final group, sorry, there should be a number four right here, um, of phytoplankton that we'll go over, are the diatoms. And these guys really are the most prominent of all the phytoplankton. Um, when we think uh, phytoplankton bloom, when we think spring bloom, when we think um, robust growth and green, green oceans, we think diatoms. These guys, again, are everywhere. Um, they're the largest of, of the phytoplankton. They, you know, they can average between, you know, less than 100 microns to 300, but, but, um, but can get as big as 500 microns, so about a half a millimeter. And so the largest ones we can actually start to see with our naked eye. Um, they too make um, an armor or an exoskeleton out of um, what we kind of term opal, but, what, but it's just a compound made of silica that we call silicate, um, and we call that armor a frustule. So it's silicon armor. So, which makes them uh, also heavier and gives them um, the potential to sink out of the water column to the sea floor. Um, but these guys are th are the dominant um, phytoplankton because they are very, very good at growing very, very fast when times are good. So, when environmental conditions are optimal. So, every time we sort of stir up or get a large input of nutrients, these guys take off and they're large and they do a lot of photosynthesis and so they're very, very highly productive, making them the uh, uh, 
sort of the, the dominant player out there and making up for a large, large portion of global um, primary productivity. Um, we could see here off of, um, actually, I, you have to excuse me, I kind of forget which coast this is, but we could see all these greens in here in a satellite image are, are, are diatom blooms. Um, and in this one, we could see a, a, a bloom of, uh, of several different species. So these, these bright blues in here um, are actually coccoliths. The darkest greens and some of the paler greens are diatoms, and then where you see the bluish greens mixing and swirling together, like over here and over here, um, we're getting overlays of probably mixtures of of both species, both diatoms and coccoliths. So, in these satellite images, give you a really good idea of just how robust, how how abundant the growth is of these guys, and that gives you an idea of just just how large a role they play in photosynthesis, which is um, essentially carbon fixation, right, fixing inorganic carbon, turning it into organic carbon, but also oxygen production for all the aerobes on Earth to breathe. Okay, so that ends it for the, the major groups of phytoplankton I want you guys to uh, be responsible for. Um, thanks for joining me. See you next lesson.